You are listening to the third segment of the four-part series, Tom Campbell at Sky Blue Symposia. In this segment, Tom discusses relationships in the physical material reality, families, aging, and transitions. back with segment three of our conversation with Tom Campbell. Tom, as we ended the last segment, we were talking about male-female relationships. We'd like to explore some other relationship topics now in a little bit greater depth, specifically relationships in the PMR amongst families, the aging, and transitions. Chipper has our first question in this topic area. Tom, this is a question from my lovely wife, who I have a better relationship with her than I've ever expected I would have with anyone. And part of that was due to my realizing that when she describes stuff to me, it's not that she wants me to fix it. It's just that she wants to delineate that structure within which she feels a certain way. But she had a question. As older adults, with more time available each day to think about how they live their lives, they find themselves rebalancing between their present work styles in a large corporation, for example, and at the same time working toward identifying fears that lead to holding on to ego. This can slow progress. Do you have any suggestions to people who have a very established work environment and possibly management roles as to how to operate very differently with love when the workplace is not really set up for that approach? Yeah, that's a that's a problem. You know, we are expected to interact within uh, social structures all the time uh, that have constraints that don't let us really express ourselves fully in those inside of those structures. I think the thing you can do there is that you can move that structure as much as you have the ability to move it, which means if you know, you're the, the sole owner of the corporation, you have a lot of uh, leeway. If you're just a, you know, a low level employee, then you better, you know, you just do what you're told and you do it the way you're told to do it. And you really don't have any, but somewhere in between are most of us, and we can modify, particularly for managers. We can modify things. We can care about our people. We can care about their careers and giving them opportunities and trying to help them, you see, make it about them. You know, well, what does this person need to, to provide a good opportunity for him in his career as opposed to what do I need this person to do for me? We need to think of both of those things, not just – one or the other so there are things we can we can do in the workplace but if you've got a very um, strict environment in a workplace you have to i mean you have to abide by those rules and those procedures and the way things are done there you can't we, we don't make a lot of progress by trying to man the you know the ramparts and and force the organization to be more the way we want it to be that usually doesn't work it just creates more trouble than it solves if you try to fight the organization you end up making the organization just retract deeper into its beliefs and right. into its viewpoints and don't you know don't really make any progress get yourself in trouble to boot so you need to be careful there and realize that people are wherever they are and organizations are wherever they are and you have to deal with them where they are and you do the best you can under the constraints that you have and that's the best you can and you have to be happy that that's it instead of you know feeling bad that you're not doing it as well as you'd like to you have to deal with the limits that you're given so it's a tough one i know exactly what you what you mean uh, offices often require us to be ways that we'd rather that we didn't 
that's often why as people get toward retirement, they see bigger pictures. They understand more what the what's going on there at the office and what that culture really is about. And they get more and more anxious for that retirement day to come and less and less uh, anxious to get up out of bed and go to work in the morning. That's what they call being short when you're a short timer. Yeah. It's hard to it's hard to keep up uh, the pace of giving to that organization when you begin to see the big picture in which that operation uh, uh, works in. When you see the little picture, it's all about your career and the career ladder you're going up. You don't notice those other things. But the older you get, the more you notice uh, what's going on, uh, not only on the lines, but between the lines. Yeah. Well, that that what you described sounds pretty much like how she figured out how to how to deal with it is is not adversarially but supportively for the people that she was involved managerial with even though i kept saying well do this and do that and she'd look at me and say well that's not going to work so <laughs> yeah and you know what's amazing about that that if you really care for your employees and and uh care about them, not just care about what they can do for you, but care about them and their careers and their families, you know, because somebody has a big family problem. Well, you need to give them a little special, uh, you know, um, space to to deal with that instead of saying, well, that's personal business. You know, just get to work on time and and, uh, that sort of thing. If, If you're willing to work with them, you'll get so much more out of them. They don't mind giving you their all and staying late and doing whatever it takes to, you know, to make a product work. If they know that you really care for them, they'll give it back. It turns out that that's a really very productive attitude, more productive than the one of enforce the rules. That's not a very productive attitude. Right. Thank you on that. A related question is regarding our children and young adults. As parents, much energy is spent helping the child build confidence and self-worth. Recognizing that they are important, that they matter, is key to helping them not get too discouraged or depressed in school, social events, and trying to get that career path determined or first job. Then with maturing children, teenagers, parents may find themselves saying almost the opposite with phrases like, We really need to think more about letting go of our ego and identifying the fear at the base of that dominant or angry reaction that we just had. Do you have suggestions regarding the messages we could send to children today that would help them not develop such a strong connection with the stroking of their ego, but at the same time help them navigate in our society with other kids who often are very cruel and with a competitive environment for developing a skill or career or getting into college. There is a big difference between, shall we say, um, praising a child for you know, things, things well done or good attitudes or that sort of stuff and patronizing them. I think when we patronize them, which often is we tell them that whatever it is they've done or said is wonderful, when it's really not all that wonderful, that may be part of the problem. I think just building up their egos to build up their egos is probably not a good idea. I think they kind of know in their own mind that what they did was just kind of mediocre or whether it was wonderful or whether it's something they really worked hard on or whether it was quick. And if we are too quick to make them feel good about themselves, we could actually be doing them a disservice rather than a service. So I'd say when they do things, when they do things well, and it could be that it doesn't have to be much, you know, for them to do something well, you know, just a good attitude or a caring, or they pick something up without having to be told, or, you know, just little things like that. You can give them praise. Tell them how much you appreciate it. That certainly was helpful. Thank you very much for picking that up. And uh, we need to be aware of giving them as much positive things as they earn, or at least trying to earn. So yes, be as positive as possible, but don't overdo that. If we overdo it, we create a monster. They feel then like, well, I don't have to do much at all to please them, you know? Right. Whatever you or say, they think is wonderful. So that then makes them feel like when you do tell them something nice, well, you really did a good job there. It doesn't mean much. 
It's like, you know, anything free doesn't have much value. So I think we need to be careful to encourage, but not to um, falsely build up. Yeah, not to build them up falsely. And I think they'll, they know the difference when you're just telling them stuff like that, and they discount it. And then when they do something good, they discount, you tell them, and they discount that too. And right. pretty soon it's very hard to give them a good feeling about themselves because you overdid it, and they discount everything nice you say to them as not really being sincere. So always be sincere. And, and secondly, when you get to the teenagers, of course, teenagers are, have to be treated very specially because you can't just tell them what to do. Because what they're doing is finding their own way of doing things. And if somebody's in the process of finding their own way, you telling them the way is not helpful to them. They rebel against that. They don't like that. You know how it is when the children learn something. If a, if a child learns a, a task of some sort and then you try to do it for them, it incenses them that you're trying to do it for them as if they couldn't do it themselves. You know, that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. So when you try to give a teenager guidance they often don't like it because what they're trying to do is find their own way and by giving them guidance it's like oh you gave me the answer you know that 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 doesn't help i need to do this on my own so we have to again look at them and see where they are think about them and what they need and realize that they need to make mistakes they need to do things on their own and they need to have guidance but not orders well, it doesn't mean they don't need orders sometimes, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, you know, uh, I've done something similar like that, and here's how it worked out for me. And you tell them that rather than, I know what you should do. You need to do it this way. Believe me, I know. You see, there's a big difference. One of them, you're just giving them some information and letting them do with it what they want, and the other one, you're telling them what to do. So we need to be careful about how we approach our our teens and realize that they are, you know, changing and they're in a lot of change and they have to complete these changes on their own. You can't do it for them, which right. means you have to make decisions. And some of those decisions will be poor. And when they're poor, you can't lord that over and say, see, I told you, you know, <laughs> you need to do that. You need to do what I say because that doesn't help them grow up. That might help them. They might, that might help them get one thing right, but you know, that's a battle. They're trying to win the war. So if you constantly tell them what to do and they are obedient and they do it, they come out the other end not having learned anything except to be obedient and do what you're told. Well, that's not what we want them to grow up to be. We want them to grow up to be self-sufficient and uh, able to make their own way in the world, in which case we need to give them a, a lot of rope when they get in those, those teenage years. So when they blow off the handle like that and you'd like to point out that uh, – that was pretty uh, self-serving and uh, pretty egotistical and whatever, do it indirectly. Rather than telling them how they're wrong, you should explain to them how you understand how they feel that way. First, get on their side. Explain, yeah, I can see how you might feel that way. And then give them information without it being personal to them. Yeah, I was like that when I was a kid too. And here's what happened to me, you know. You're not telling them the answer, but you're giving them from information that they can use to help them get the answer, but they're still getting it. Right. So it's the trick we have to do. Give them information in a way that they can use it. If we give them information in a way that they can't use it, it just makes things worse. And they can't use it if we just tell them how to be. They can use it if we offer it in a non-judgmental way that lets them Use it and save face, if you will. Right. Not practice digging in their heels. So that's that's the thing. Yeah, teenagers are very difficult because they are in this indeterminate stage, and they've got to do it themselves, and they've got to do it their own way. And that comes back to us as if, as uh, you know, my parents are stupid. You know, my parents don't know anything. Yeah. Well, that's just a way of of them expressing this thing about I have to do it myself. It's not really so much that they think you're stupid as it is they don't really know what's going on either. They're not really intellectually aware of why they do and feel and say the things they do. A lot of it's being pushed by hormones and, and pushed by by uh, other things, and they're just getting through it the best they can. And we need to be as helpful and, and uh, 
not push back, force right. them to be nice little adults because they're not. They're, <laughs> they're not adults. <laughs> process that we need to be uh, very sympathetic with that and often giving them examples of ourselves and our bad, our bad judgments and the things that happen to us and, and so on uh, will help them. And they know that you're trying to help them on some level. They know that you're, you're caring. And the reason that you're complaining about their behavior is because you care about them. But that uh, doesn't help them um, grow up. You're just suggesting to them behavioral changes, and that's not really helpful to them. They need, to, they need information that they can use in terms of making their own decisions better, making better decisions. So if you think of it that way would be my, my advice – don't be judgmental. Be as positive as you can. But, uh, I mean, sometimes you have to just say no, right? You have right. to lay, lay down the law and put your foot down and say no. You know, you are not going to go out with that person. You're not going to stay out all night. You're not going to Fort Lauderdale with your friends for two weeks. <laughs> you, know, you sometimes have to do that because you, you know, you have to protect them. That's your well, job. Yeah, that's that's also you need to you need to give them the fence that they're looking for sometimes, and patience comes in mighty handy during those those learning experiences. And sometimes you give them the excuse that they're looking for. They really are very nervous about going off with their friends for two weeks. You know, they're not so sure that's going to be a good idea, and. Uh, if you say no and they get to say, oh, my parents say no, they can save face with their friends. So sometimes you're giving them an excuse that they're looking for. But, yes, often you're giving them that fence. But they need to have structure. I mean, people need structure. Without structure, things lose meaning. So the structure is important and consistency to structure is important. And, uh, yeah, other than that, good luck, my friend. I've been there and done that. <laughs> Well, she's she's no longer a teenager. She's uh, mid twenties, and I I think we did okay. Yeah, I I'll, I'll know next time, I guess. I had a friend who had all daughters. He had uh, I think four, four daughters, and they were all very close in age. And he was very fond of saying that at thirteen they go insane and don't become you know and and start to come back to sanity somewhere after eighteen, you know. <laughs> By yeah. mid twenties, they're they're you know they're wonderful again, just like they were when they were ten. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks. That that that'll be pleasing to for my wife to hear those answers. Thank you. Tom, we're gonna jump over to Susan in the later stages in life. Okay. Hi, Tom. I wanted to speak with you about dying or. A transition to another reality is probably a better description of it. Um, in Tibetan Buddhism, dying is seen as a process of moving through bardo, or transitional states. The first one being when an individual unit of consciousness experiences the divine and bliss, and they call it uh, returning to our original state. This is then followed by a terrifying hallucination where one faces negative projections or fears. And they say that these then help decide on the next incarnation. It sounds to me somewhat like a test where we have opportunities to face ourselves fully, sometimes similar to what you've described that can happen in out-of-body states. How does the Tibetans experience thus teachings compare with your experience? Well, they do sort of agree. It's uh, Their metaphors are, are not that far off from the kind of metaphors I use. They're just a little more um, dramatic, I guess, than the ones that I, I use. This idea mm. of um, you uh, begin with this uh, uh, divine bliss, sort of returning to your original state. You see, I would I would say that uh, when you die here, you do you wake up in you know a, a different reality frame, one that's meant just for that transition, and the immediate feeling you have is this kind of divine and bliss because that's a good relaxer. It makes you kind of uh, kind of chill out and, and get on with business because this death is usually a, a pretty unpleasant process, 
and scary process for a lot of people. And uh, this this uh, divine and bliss sense of feeling that you get of having that you're in the right place and everything's going to be okay. That's indeed the kind of feeling that you get, and that you're returning to your original state. That this is uh, this is where you came from. Well, in a sense, it was because you planned your incarnation uh, in the same general uh, neighborhood and area, and this is where you came from. In that in that sense, that's kind of a, a local sense of that, but it but it is. So, I would agree with that. And then this terrifying hallucination, where one faces negative projections or fears. I wouldn't say it's so terrifying of a hallucination. One, it's not a hallucination, and two, it's not really all that terrifying most of the time. It depends on how grown or ungrown you are. What happens is that if if you're grown just enough to where it's worth their while to, to, to sit down and talk with somebody about what you want to do next and what you need to work on in the next incarnation, then one of the things you know that happens is that you have this this uh, person, and you say like a social worker, right? And they're working with you, and they're talking about, well, we think that you need to work on this or work on that. You you really had uh, a lot of fear in this in this area, and that caused you a lot of trouble last time. So, I think something that that brings that out and allows you to work on that would be a good thing. And of course, you almost always to people just beginning get this thing. What do you mean? What fear? I didn't have any fear about that. <laughs> You know, it's kind of denial because they don't yet get it. They haven't seen the connections between the way they acted and and the the fear and the beliefs that they had. So then you get this this uh, what they're calling the terrifying hallucination. You get this this movie almost that you're looking at that goes right back to where you were indeed. You know. Uh, having a, a very bad case of this fear, maybe anger management or uh, that sort of thing. And it's so obvious that this is the problem, and you go, oh, well, yeah, but it was just that once. you know. So then they re <laughs> film or fast forward and show you another 10 times or exactly like that, or maybe another 50 times or exactly like that. And you say, yeah, but it, it wasn't me. It was because these people did, you know, and then they show you more. So they have this, this uh, movie of your life and all of the attitudes and feelings that you had. So it's not just the actions. It's that you actually feel the feelings. It's, again, like being there. And no excuses and no way to talk yourself out of this. You kind of see the plain, unpleasant truth of the level of your fear and the level of your beliefs, where you did things that hurt you and hurt others, where you did things where you could have made better choices and you took terrible choices that made things worse for you, that caused you pain. And you get to see all those. And you also can go look at the probability of what would have happened if you made different choices. Oh, remember that choice where you blew up and and uh, da 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 and then this happened and then your wife left you and, and then, uh, you know, all these other things happen and you say, yeah, that was a terrible time in my life, you know. Those people did that to me, and of course they point out that's not the case. And then they say, well, look, had you chosen to do this instead, here's what's likely to have happened. So you get these sorts of uh, instruction, if you will. I, I wouldn't call them terrifying hallucinations, but I suppose they, they might uh, uh, be unpleasant things for, for many people to see where your weaknesses and, and the things you did poorly, but it's all meant to be educational. Nobody's trying to terrify you or, or make you uh, cry. They're just, they want to help you out. So you see a bigger picture next time instead of just the little picture. So these sorts of things do happen, uh, kind of in that, in that order like that. Um, so it's not that far off, but it's a little strong, I'd say, the, the divine and the bliss. Well, you know, yes, you feel just fine and everything's okay and it's all right and you don't the fear is gone and the, and all the anxiety are gone and you might call that divine and bliss but i think that's a little strong and the terrifying hallucination is a little strong but in general yeah i agree with uh, what's going on in the order that they that they happen in that's very reassuring to hear that because some of their language i don't know if it's a cultural difference or not um it, it is a bit extreme so that's very helpful, and uh, you know it's the same it, thing. 
talked about on the very first one, the very first question, and that is nobody's really going to listen to you if it isn't scary. <laughs> very true. Very true. <laughs> Well, I think I think this will be very helpful. And I've heard you say that dying can be an opportunity for a consciousness boost. Could you speak some more of that and maybe advice to dealing with any resistances that might arise as we move through this transition period? Well, yes, and, and depending on how the listeners out there interpret that, I want to make clear that that doesn't mean that you get a boost in the quality of consciousness because you've died. Right. You know, just dying doesn't uh, doesn't give you this this uh, suddenly you become illuminated because you're dead. You know that doesn't happen. People have that idea that oh when I die I'll know all the answers. You know and and I'll mm-hmm. be I'll be perfect then. It's just this this body I'm in is why I'm imperfect. It's not like that. When you die you're really not much better than you were just before you died. It doesn't you don't get a, a boost to your consciousness for dying but the process of dying itself yes process of getting old and the process of dying the process of getting old makes you or helps you encourages you to see what's important and what's not when you're young you're so uh, you know what they say you're you you know you're up to your uh, waist in alligators you know so you you're not worrying about uh, you know things that are going on in the next swamp you're just totally focused on all the emergencies and all the things you have to deal with so you don't really pay attention to the big pictures of things you're totally caught up in the little picture as you age that changes or at least it has an opportunity to change because you're not so busy you're not caught up in the little things you have time to sit back and see things in in context have a more holistic viewpoint and that's a good opportunity if you take that opportunity to grow up because when you see it in a bigger picture, you see that what it all boils down to is that love matters. And all of that other stuff you had, you know, all of those fights and all of those squabbles and all of that angst and, and all all that just disappears. It's, it's not important, you know, that the stuff that really is significant is the love stuff. It's the caring stuff. And the things that are that are really important to you is the stuff you gave, not the stuff you got. Yes. When you're young and you do a really good job at work and you get an award, you're real proud of that award and you maybe show it to everybody. But when you're older and you did really good work and got a reward, you're really proud that you did really good work. <laughs> so it's a different thing as you get older. So that's good. And then the dying process. When you know you're about to die, one or of a couple of things can happen. One, you get paralyzed with fear. And you just are fighting it. No, no, I don't want to die, you know. And it's this constant denial and fear and fighting. You're not going to learn anything from that. But if in this process of dying, you accept it and you see, you kind of look at your life and see, you know, what was good there? What did I did right? And what would I like to have done over? And, you know, kind of a a little, you know, old people like to reminisce, right? Well, part of that reminiscing is just recontacting the, their life experiences so that they can learn from them. Sometimes when it happened, you didn't learn anything. But on hindsight, you can learn some things about those experiences. So hopefully you'll have enough memory that you can do that. But in any case, not going into death with fear is very helpful. If you go into death with a lot of fear, your transition is going to be a lot more problematical. If you go in as a transition, you know, Mm -hmm. as... Death is a part of life. It's the next step, right? It's uh, it's just the way it is. And even if you have no idea that there's anything after, it doesn't matter. It's just, okay, you know, this is it. You accept it, and you're going to go. You go in with peace and calm. Then you can interact with your family, with your loved ones, and the interactions are good. But if you – and you'll, you'll learn a lot then. You'll kind of see the things that are important. So it is a growing time, whereas if you interact with fear, then because it's so fear-based, your interactions with other people are shallow and not so useful. You know, right. people are telling you, oh, you'll be all right, you're not going to die, because they know that if you, they say anything else, you know, you won't be able to handle it. So you can't actually have an honest can- conversation with anybody. And then your 
all alone because you can't really talk to anyone about it because no one will talk honestly with you because they don't think you can deal with it. So being able to deal with it, finding calm, finding peace, acceptance, letting go, um, kind of going over it and seeing what you can learn, all of this can be very helpful, good opportunities as you, as you get older. But with, like anything, there's opportunity for making good choices. There's opportunity for making bad choices, too. Yeah. So advice dealing with resistances. What kind of resistances are you, are you talking? Well, resistances to, as you, as you mentioned, the possibility of death or, or that there's a possibility of healing at that time or, or putting closure on unfinished business or not attending to one's own internal process or and physical process as well. You know, some people I've seen battle things, um, remain in denial or um, or even have regrets about their life. They wish they had done things differently and therefore wish they had more time. Yeah, see, all of that's counterproductive. Uh, mm -hmm. Guilt is useless you just accept and learn you know that's yeah. what you do. and and yes you can make peace with things you can uh, realize that that silly argument that you had with your brother and you haven't talked to each other for 10 years that you're not going to have more than another couple of months go call up your brother ask him how he's doing tell him that you love him you know you can do those kinds of things that you wouldn't have done otherwise because now you have a bigger perspective than you had before before you were wrapped up in ego, and now you realize that ego is useless. You know that, that's nothing important there. So it's a good time to take stock and and uh, heal, mend fences. Um, all that stuff becomes a lot easier when you realize that ego is not important. It's not where the action is. The, the caring and the love is where the action is. And you you uh, if you use that time for healing, then you make good use of it. If you use that time for denial and um, for fussing and complaining because you're unhappy, because you're going to die and it frightens you, then you've wasted the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. This is very helpful. I, I find it uh, extremely wise. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. Yes, thanks, Tom. Prior to the PMRN transition, there are other family challenges that are experienced. Sibel would like to ask you a question relating to that earlier time period. Okay. It's the universe is giving us a lot more extended caregiving roles with many elderly with dementia and uh, children and adult children with autism and mental illness. And these are kind of quote unquote unproductive jobs that are consuming a lot of time and energy. And universe seems to give themes of experience for a reason. What do you suppose is the reason behind this increase in caregiving experience? Okay, well there are there are several. Um, yes, we are supposed to be learning something about caring and nurturing and uh, environment caused illness. Uh, from the big picture perspective, there is no unproductive job. If one can learn something valuable from a situation, then it's productive. Of course, they were talking about economics, and I'm talking about personal growth. So personal growth is very, is very productive. Um, given the paradigm that uh, stuff happens and we all, you know, we're just supposed to deal with it, then any situation can provide growth opportunities and the system is always anxious to give us growth opportunities. But the question is, why are we getting more of this, you know, these types of opportunities now? Well, for one, it's good PMR feedback. Okay, we must live the consequences of the choices we make. Okay, this is true at the individual level and at the collective level. We immerse ourselves in anxiety by day and watch TV and eat junk food by night. We're critically undernourished and grossly overfed. Pain appears to be the most effective teacher. We haven't seen, felt anything yet compared to what is coming. The population is aging and our individual and collective health is deteriorating. All the things you mentioned 
are likely to get much worse. And why is that good PMR feedback? I don't mean good in the sense that it's wonderful feedback, but good in the sense it's what we need. We won't act if we don't feel pain. That's that's a that kind of tells you at what level we are at learning. You know, what sort of what sort of critters are there that we know that uh, don't react or don't get it? You know, if it doesn't hurt, well, you know, very young, right? It reminds you of uh, trying to uh, house train a puppy or something. You know, you need to. You need to be forceful enough. They understand that that uh, you don't like that. We learn better by fear, or I shouldn't say by fear, by pain. We learn better by pain than any other way. If we get, if we don't get pain, we're not interested in learning. We're just interested in kicking back and saying, "Ah, oh, everything's great. Don't change what isn't broken," and we let it all slide. If we get pain and enough pain, then we start to think, "What's wrong? What should we do differently?" So when we see these, uh, all these these people who uh, need this extra extra help, partly that's just feedback coming back. People are eating terribly. Uh, there's going to be a lot more poor health in the future. We probably will see in the next, you know, five or six or ten years, next decade, that lifespans are actually starting to come down. They're going to stop going up because of the way. You know, we eat and what we do to our bodies. So it's uh, it's going to get worse. So that's one thing. And it's also good NPMR feedback. We need something to push us into being less self-centered. And we're now almost grown up enough to be able to handle it and learn from such a lesson. Okay, there, would been, there was a time when if people were a problem, the, the thing to do was put them in an institution. Get rid of them. Uh, let somebody else handle it. And that's kind of disappearing to the point that more people are taking responsibility to uh, deal about these with caring and nurturing rather than just, well, not my problem and push it off on someone else. That's good. That's what I mean. We seem to be a little more grown up now, almost grown up enough to be able to handle it and learn from it. It's a tough lesson. But... Uh, it's a very good lesson. You learn an awful lot about giving, which is about love, when you have to help somebody who is cantankerous, when you have to be take care of somebody who doesn't even know who you are, when you have to give to people who are in such great need. That's a, that's a good learning experience. So in general, I'd say we get what we need and deserve as far as the non-physical goes, non-physical feedback. And that's true individually and collectively. So we collectively kind of need and deserve this this feedback. And we're going to deserve a lot more of it if we don't understand, uh, you know, what we're doing to contribute to these health problems. Yeah, I, I see a lot of it. And I, um, I'm in my 40s. And so it's certainly dramatically changed my thoughts about taking care of my health because I don't want to have 15 years of dependency, you know. And then I watch, you know, the adult children who are in their 60s who are taking care of someone who's in their 80s or, and they have to be so adult because they don't get understanding. They don't get appreciation. They don't, you can't reason anymore. You just have to be forgiving. Right, you can't. I'll I'll help your needs if you help my needs. It's just how can I help your needs? Yeah, and and if if the caregiver can't get into that place, it's it's a pretty painful job. Yes, it's a pretty painful job, but it's 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 do it's being done more and more. Um, you know, the fellow that runs uh, my forum, uh, Ted Ballers, he spent 10 years taking care of his father who had severe Alzheimer's and then probably, I don't know, it wasn't that long after his father passed away that he had another long spate of taking care of his mother who then went into Alzheimer's. So he spent, uh, you know, two and a half, well, maybe two decades, maybe one and a half to two decades with a job of just taking care of parents. 
Yeah, yeah, just and and I can see it. It's gonna affect the culture. It hasn't quite yet, but yes, we'll wait to the you know the the population, the big population boom that everybody talks about. The big baby boom is getting to that age where, uh, in the years to come, there's going to be a lot more of uh, what you're seeing. This is just the beginning of that. You know, I'm at the very beginning of that baby boom. Matter of fact, I'm I. I just come like a year before it was officially started, like the 45, 1945, 1946. Those are the years where they say the baby boom started, and I was born in 44. So I'm just on the leading edge of that, and I'm a couple of years out of being 70. So, you know, the baby boom is in their middle 60s now, the head, the leading edge of it. And it won't be but another decade or two before uh, – the number of people who fall into that category of needing a lot of of loving service is going to grow dramatically. Hopefully, we will continue to take care of them and find ways to, to meet their needs lovingly and not just uh, send them off to an institution to, uh, you know, die. Yeah. Well, it, it is happening a lot less. Yeah. And, you know, since I work with the elderly, one of the things that's interesting is that Two-year-olds are fairly uniform, but 60-year-olds, you have the possibility of being a marathon runner or being in a wheelchair. You yeah. know, so in your older years, there's so much open possibilities, you know. Yeah, with two-year-olds, you all start at about the same place and then grow differently. So in the beginning, there's not a lot of difference. But on the other end, you're all totally different, and then you all kind of come together to you know to the the last days where you die and and uh, you come at it from a lot of different places yeah well thank you before we close this segment tom would you tell us a little bit about the books that you have sure those people are listening to this who want to know more have an interest uh, there are several places you can go uh, one of course would be my website which is www.mybigtoe.com there you will be able to buy books, but if you really don't want to buy a book, you can go to Google Books and you can read it there for free. Uh, otherwise, you could go to Amazon or, or Barnes & Noble or any bookstore, and, and if they don't have it, you can always order it. So it's available pretty much out there in all the usual, usual ways. You go to my website, and there's a forum there. And on that forum, there's lots of discussion and lots of very smart people who have been talking about this and thinking about it uh, for a long time, very knowledgeable. And that would be a good place to either just read. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of posts there on every subject imaginable. And that would be a good place to find out more of your specific questions. Otherwise, for general information, go to YouTube. And YouTube, you could type in my YouTube ID, which would be TWCJR44, or you can just type in Tom Campbell, or you could probably just type in my big toe and you will be able to get it pretty quickly. Or you can go to Google and Google Tom Campbell or my big toe and they will show you lots of places that you can go. But the YouTube station is, is nice, or I guess channels, what they call it, is very nice because I have all of the workshops and all of the interviews that I've done go up on YouTube. And they're there available um, for everyone for free. One of the best ones, if you want a good summary of the ideas here and, and get a good understanding of the theory as well as the practice of how to apply it, would be the Calgary workshop. And it came in a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Basically just a few hours on Friday intro. And then Saturday is the theory and Sunday is the application. So if you go there, you will get perhaps more than you really want, but still it's a, it's a good overall uh, view of what I'm all about and what my theories are. You'll get more of the science there because I deal with the science more in my lectures than I do in my books because the books are really targeted to a, a very general audience and the workshops are people who are already interested or they wouldn't be there. If you want more of the science, find it at, at YouTube. You can find it on YouTube, and you can find it at MBT Events. That's the third place to go. MBTEvents.com are the people that do my organization, my scheduling. They put the things up on YouTube for me, and they schedule uh, where I go and, and uh, when I go there. So that is a good site to find out what's, what's happening in the near future. 
well, that's about it. So um, I, I urge everyone to look into more more detail because in an interview like this, it's very difficult to give you enough detail to answer even your most fundamental questions. It's kind of a quick pass over the top of a lot of very interesting ideas, but there's really not a lot of time for deriving the the answers that I give. I, you pretty much, I just state them and, and that's that. You kind of have to take it at, uh, you know, words value and that's sometimes not good enough for a lot of people. They'd like to see, well, why did he say that? Where did that come from? Well, you'll find it on YouTube and in the books. Thanks, Tom. This completes the third segment of the four-part series, Tom Campbell at Sky Blue Symposia.